Good morning on this delightful day in Ichunga. On behalf of the Church Council, I welcome you. To those who are in the building, and as you would have walked in, you would have seen the cornerstone from the 26th of February, 1884. Of course, it was a Wesleyan chapel back in those days. In 1900, it became the Ichunga Methodist Church. And today in 1997, it is, since 1970, 1977, it's been known, of course, as the Achunga Uniting Church, built at a cost of 440 pounds, just for your interest. We welcome those in the garden. We welcome those who are seated out the back this morning. We welcome those who are watching at home via live stream. We welcome those who work, worship here regularly. We welcome those who are visitors today. We welcome those who are generational in Ichunga. We know there are people here whose grandfathers or grandparents and great-grandparents were in Ichunga in 1884. And you're with us today as well, and we're thrilled that you can be with us. And we welcome visitors. I met a man on the street the other day who said, I'm coming, and I've never been to your church before, but I thought it would be a good thing to do. And particularly, we welcome Her Excellency this morning, and Ron Bunton, her husband, uh, both delightful people, and it's such a pleasure to welcome you to Ichunga Uniting Church this morning on this very special occasion. Our call to worship is the song that we've been listening to this morning, How Great Thou Art. You probably know, but it was written one year after our church was built in 1885. And it just is testimony to the great God that we are worshipping this morning. A God who has been, in terms of this church, been with us, showed his love, his care, his support to the people of this church, this village. We know it's this nation, it can go through the world. But in terms of us, the tough days of the 1880s, the tough days of the 1800s as this village was established, through the wars, and we sent men to the wars, through the Great Depression, through bushfires, which many of here have known, through the gold days of the 1850s, through many parts of the story of Achunga and this village, through seven kings and queens since 1884 of Australia. And that's another reminder. Thank you for coming, Your Excellency, <laughs> and representing King Charles in our, in our place this morning. But of course, God is the King of Kings, and it's he that we worship this morning because he has shown his love in this community and for his family and all those who have come to a saving knowledge because of the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So let's stand and sing uh, a beautiful song that calls, it's called Forever and it's just a reminder of that love that has been since time, the beginning of creation and will continue forever. Please stand.
Father God, creator of all things, our hearts are full of gratitude this morning as we reflect upon the people who have been touched by your love, your grace, your support, your care during the last 140 years in this place. Thank you today that you are here now. Meet with each of us, we pray, in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. While we're standing, let's sing another song. And it just talks and reminds us of the mystery, the majesty of this creator God of ours. Behold our God.
Matt Karat, our minister who's been with us for over 10 years, to speak with the children this morning. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Chris. Well, good morning. Good morning. Welcome to all of those who are uh, wherever you are this morning. It is wonderful to, to have so many here, so familiar faces, and some that I met yesterday who have a long, long history here. Normally, at this point in our services, oh, we'd bring the children down the front and we'd share with them. But I'll get you to stay where you are, children, because I know you're probably all over this place this morning. But I'd like to, to share with you a story. And before I do that, a part of that story will be, watch this video on the screen. Uh, now, this is the Ichunga Uniting Church uh, on the 150th anniversary of the town's existence. And at that stage, the church was being restored, partly done. And these are a few shots of the um, Thanksgiving service that was held to praise God that the job was underway and that in due course, the following month, it would be finished. The old building, uh, of course, was painted over the old blue stone, magnificent stones being underneath, and uh, an old porch on the front, uh, which has changed somewhat. And the work went on with the help of a few people who knew what they were doing, and it's uh, a tribute to those that had the initiative and the drive, and the church as a whole, to get behind this project to restore it for the 150th anniversary of Ichunga. Now look, that video, there is, there is a lot of footage, so we'll stop it there. But I love that, uh, that picture because uh, you can see in that video that some things have changed and some things haven't changed. I wonder, kids, is it, uh, could you see anything that had changed between now and then? Did you notice? What did you see? The door is on a different side, yes. I noticed that hairstyles might have changed a little bit. <laughs> and perhaps some of those vehicles are probably no longer running. Uh, that would have been in the late 80s and uh, around the time of 105 years of this building. And uh, as you heard, uh, there is a long history. And today we're celebrating 144 years of this building. And if you've been into the historical display next door, uh, there's a bit of a story to tell. I'd like to, I've got someone to help me with that story. Uh, would they like to come forward? Because this is a historical event. <laughs> and uh, so what should we call you today? Mrs. Owen. Mrs. Owen, okay. And yes, rooted in history, fantastic. So Mrs. Owen uh, may have been around at this time, uh, or maybe not quite. But but back in, uh, you can see you can see you can see on the on the screen uh, that uh, there was a Wesleyan Chapel, 1857. So in the 50s, one of the first buildings built in the Achunga Township was a Wesleyan Chapel. It was built up the road here on Mariana Street, and uh, it served the the community. People gathered here. In fact, let, let's, let's rewind the story a little bit more. We, we, we should too recognise that uh, this land was walked by the Paramount people well before that. And uh, we acknowledge them. They, they walked and, and, and loved and cared for this land. Settlers moved into the area and set it up as a, as a, a farming land. And uh, as a result, over history, it didn't take long for the town of Achunga to be established. Some of those wanted to worship God. They built this chapel up in Mariana Street, which served the church for a number of years before this block of land was donated. And tomorrow, we celebrate not 
uh, 140 years of, of this church, but 140 years of the laying of the foundation stone that is in the corner of the building there. So we've got a few more photos. Here is what that building looked like back, perhaps in your day, Mrs. Owen. But, but did, that's, do you remember, you recall that? It's, no, it does look a little bit different. Yes, when you were walking the streets. Yes, ha happens a bit still. But uh, good to have you along. Over the years, though, this building, uh, as you could see, it, it didn't have all of those spaces. And so uh, there was a period, and some of you have reminded me of this yesterday, where uh, this church as a part of the Mount Barker circuit was very small in number. We've got a decent building. It can seat 150, according to those uh, reports. But uh, there was a point where there was only a few families here. And the, decision, the question was put, do we close this church? It was decided that the church would stay open. The building would continue. And some 40-odd years ago, some families started moving back in. And it outgrew this building, and some more buildings were built. Somebody decided it was a great idea to paint over the stonework into a, a beautiful uh, colour. That was chipped away. The community grew. The mezzanine floor was built that some of you are sitting on today. And uh, renovation after renovation, change has taken place. And this photo was taken last year in this space as we uh, have done some final renovations for this season. A new roof, uh, new uh, paint and lighting and fans and, and all sorts of other things that have happened as well. And within that, there have been a community, a faithful group of people here. We have Mrs. Owens and... and uh, we, yeah, we, let's get... Would you, Sophia, would you like to be our modern, uh, modern day person? What... How do, we, how do we look modern? Can you stand over this side? This is What, what says modern more than a, you know, a set of sunnies? <laughs> Styles have changed. The way we present the building has changed. Lots has changed over this time. But uh, what has remained at the core is the people, faithful people, come and gone, some of you have had seasons here. Uh, and, and more than that, a, a faithful God who we've already sung about, who's been faithful and continues to be faithful for generations of, of Owens and others down the line. And to those uh, young whippersnappers that are yet to come in their Taylor Swift shirts or whatever they're wearing these days. But God remains constant and faithful. It's the people. And so that's what we celebrate today, God's faithfulness to the people of this community in changing seasons, different styles, all that's come and gone, God is faithful. So thank you to our helpers. Thank you, Mrs. Owens. And uh, you can go back to wandering the streets if you like. <laughs> Fantastic. It's great. Now, if there are any children here today, uh, we do have a program if you'd like, and I'd rather not stay where you are, you can go out. Uh, if you'd like to meet Judy, uh, at the front of the church, from whatever space you're gathering, she will take you next door to the playground area of Wandine if you'd like to go out. Otherwise, the rest of us are going to continue. And I will... Ah, oh, excellent. So as the children go out, you're welcome to go or stay. Uh, we're going to sing a song that was sung... Tomorrow, 140 years ago, at a service that, where they laid the foundation stone. There was nothing else here apart from that foundation stone. And it was, the service was celebrated. And this is a song that was sung at that service. So I invite you to stand up. You may or may not know this one, but the words are beautiful and fitting for this day, 140 years later.
pleasure now to welcome Steve Schiller. Steve, would you like to come up, mate? Steve is the author of this book, and I highly recommend it, having just read it. And it, also, it talks in, about some of his journeys at Echunga Uniting Church. And I remember him as a very mixed-up young man who used to sit in the back pew and made sure that he was out of church before anyone saw him, while he was in his search for truth and God's love. It's a great story. And he stayed for quite a while in the end. I remember vividly in 1989, uh, we attended a, a John Wimber Signs and Wonders conference in Melbourne together. And we were very brave because we went in his $200 clapped out old bomb. <laughs> Thanks, and No, sorry. And miraculously made it. But the reason I mentioned John Wimber's conference is that during that time, one of it, in one of the sessions, John said... There are people here in this room with the gift of healing, and I don't know who they are. And he did a prayer, and he said, turn to the person next to you and just put your hand on their arm. And I put my hand on Steve's arm, and that was, he, that was it. He put his hand on my arm, and it burned my arm. And it just confirmed for Steve, if he didn't already know at that stage, that God had given him a gift of healing. That's by way of introduction. Re there are some of these going to be available in Wandine afterwards, and I'm going to get my copy signed because he's here today. <laughs> but share, share with us some of your stories, Steve. Bless you. Oh, I'll tell you what, it's an absolute privilege to be here. And, and one of the reasons is there's got to be so many stories that are bounced out of this place in 140 years. Because man will build a building, but God will build people. You know, and, and we are the building of God. And there's only one door on the Christian church. His name is Jesus. And if you don't understand that, you need to find the door and get in. You know, so, yeah, I wandered in here uh, one morning and I sat at the back corner over there and I, I got in before everyone, after everyone started. I didn't want anyone to see me. And I took off, took off out of the joint before Anyone said hello? Um, I probably snuck up and butted out my cigarette on the on the gateway as I was coming. Um, and leading up to that, I'd grown up in a, I'd grown up in the church um, out, out at Mount Torrens. Uh, lived out at Mount Torrens, and I'd gone to the Lutheran church, and I believed in the Trinity uh, as a kid. I was told about Santa Claus and Easter Bunny and God, um, and so I, I understood the Trinity as best I could, and I got rid of uh, Easter Bunny. Sorry, kids, and. Um, <laughs> I won't say any more. And, and finally, finally I threw God out too because it just seemed so superficial and garbage and, 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 and all my mates were atheists and, and, and to be honest, uh, atheism was pretty easy because there's no accountability. And if, the, you know, these Ten Commandments and I was failing them all really bad. I was, I was a good sinner. I was really good at sinning. Um, so I didn't believe in God. And then I heard this crazy guy share his story, his testimony. And he'd done um, a, a long period of time in Yatla Prison and there he met Jesus. And he spoke about God like God was real. I thought this guy's an idiot. I despised him. I hated him. And I was under turmoil from his words for probably about three to four months. Um, and I was uh, staying down at Strathalbyn a lot. And I was in and out of living in a car and I, life just spiralled down. And, and I was a complete mess. And, but I'm tormented by his words. If you find Jesus Christ, you'll find God. I want to say, if you find Jesus Christ, you'll find the doorway to the church. You'll know God. I'm sorry, I wander around. Microphones don't work for that. It's, I'll, I'll behave. <laughs> I've been told I have to. And, and so I was on the side of a dirt road just out of Strath Avenue with some friends and they were wanting to get high on substance and I'd just had enough of everything and I wandered away from the car and... And I don't know why, because it doesn't make sense why someone with my belief system or absence of belief system would pray, but I did. And it was like the sky opened up and it transformed me. And I drove away throwing pornography out the window and alcohol out the window and drugs out the window. And I, I did get to a packet of cigarettes. I said, you're not having them. I put them in my pocket. <laughs> but I was transformed. And I didn't even know what the word repent meant, but the Spirit of the Lord began to do something powerful. But I found in a short time that some of my 
problems returned very powerfully on me and, and, and I actually had no grounding in the Word of God. I didn't understand the Bible. Um, and I felt like I'd completely failed God, like, like he would give me a second chance and I blew it. Now, my life contained a big father wound. Who knows what a father wound is? Come on. It, it can eat into you and you're just unable to navigate life in a healthy way. And, um, and I was in that workshop office at the pub there one evening, absolutely destroyed within and feeling like life's got no purpose and God doesn't want me. And uh, I had a chain around my neck, one foot each side of a workshop pit, and I was going to drop in the pit um, and just, I'd had enough. And, and I heard a voice that was not audible, but it was so loud that it was screaming. And it was, you can't do this because you know me. And I pulled that chain off and I dropped in the bottom of the pit and I bawled my eyes out for hours. I was angry, I think, because I believed God didn't want me, but he wouldn't let me die. And then a week later, this guy over here, Glenn Pitchford, he comes in the joint. I'm not crying, all right? My eyes are just hot and sweating, okay? <laughs> he comes in and, uh, and he starts talking about Jesus. And I thought, he knows what I know. And he says, he goes to this church up here, Chug United Church. He says, it would be good if you come. And I'm thinking, it would be good if I didn't. And I finally manned up enough and I, I said to God, I said, even though you don't want me, I want you. So I sat on the back seat. I sat on the back seat. After a week or two, this guy comes and blocks the doorway, Mark Elledge. Someone gets me involved in a Bible study at Jenny Bailey's. I believe Jenny's passed away now. Another, another Miss Jenny Bailey. Yeah. You was going to that Bible study too, Chris. And one night, a very pointed opportunity for a question come up. I didn't know what I was asking, but I said, do you mean when Jesus died on the cross, he paid for me? Past, present and future. And somebody said, yes. And I thought, this is the best news ever. There is no news this good anywhere. Paid in full. But in advance, didn't know what I was doing. I was depressed. I had problems somewhere along the line. Um, Glenn and I went somewhere with a few carloads of people and I uh, went into this meeting and someone prayed for me and the, the, the Holy Spirit come on me and I, I had another language flowing out of me. I didn't know what had happened. I was dyslexic. I couldn't even read the Bible. I couldn't. That, the fact that that book exists is a miracle. Um, I could read a sentence, come to the full stop. I didn't know what was going on. But that night I came home, picked up a Bible that Jenny Bailey had given me. She said, this is God's word. This is true. Read it. This is 100% true. Miss Jenny Bailey. Let's get it right. And, um, and I flopped it open and it said, the Lord is my rock and my salvation. That was the first time I knew I'd not die of suicide. She told me to read the Gospel of John. I started to read the Gospel of John. I was just shocked at what I'm reading. You know, the stuff that it said, like Jesus sent out the disciples to cast out devils and heal the sick and raise the dead. And, and I'm looking at the stuff and he said, you know, those who believe in me, uh, these signs and wonders will follow them. And, and I'm thinking, this can't be true. This, this can't be true. If this is true, people would be doing it. I'm like, what is going on here? And I'm wrestling over it for days on end and, 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 then, and then the same words that the voice that spoke those words to me when I was going to hang myself that said, you can't do this because you know me, said this. If you don't believe everything I say, you can't believe anything I say. I was given an older maiden that frightened the heck out of me. A young man called Alan who lived in the town. I used to run amok with him. And uh, Glenn and I were at the front of the place here one night after a youth meeting and Alan was roaming the streets and we, we used to roam the streets and cause havoc in this town. And, and uh, we talked to him about Jesus. He said, all right, I'm in. He gave his life to Jesus. I gave him a Bible. I, I didn't know what to do. So I said, hey, this book is true. Every word of it. You've got to believe it and read it. Start with the Gospel of John. That's where I was told to start. So he's reading it. You know, Alan loved his skateboard. 
He was crazy. Anyone here remember Alan? <laughs> he, he, he was coming down the hill, you know, by the pub, flying down the hill on his skateboard, so in love with God. You know, we didn't know much, but perhaps we was a bit religious because we thought we had to pray with our eyes shut. And he wanted to pray. And so he's coming down the hill. And it, well, it didn't end well, did it? He, he's, oh, I go to his house. I want to follow him up and see, mate, how you going? And, and how's this? You know, I, I get there. He's all beaten up. He tells me what happened. I, I just, full of compassion, I laughed my guts out. <laughs> and, and I said, how's the Bible, mate? He said, isn't it cool how Jesus heals all these people? I said, well, I, I don't. I, I, yeah, I, I, it's cool, you know. Um, but let me tell you something, people. When you're being marinated, watch out. You're going to get tossed in the frying pan, okay? Oh, if you don't believe everything I say, you can't believe anything I say. I didn't want to answer him. I was scared. To, I wasn't going to give him an answer. I, I said, man, um, if, uh, but I, I, uh, I'll just show you another scripture here. I just showed him other verses that I'd seen in the Bible. I thought maybe I can get myself out of trouble here. And, and he says, well, we, we better pray. And I'm thinking, oh, no. I prayed with one eye open and one eye shut because if it all went wrong, he was going to punch me in the head. That was what I thought. But the pain left one arm straight away. It vanished out of him. Something inside of me went out like a volcano, like a, this is true, this Bible is true, this God is, you know, this is right. And uh, his other arm had a big lump on it and it was full of pain and, and this time we both prayed with both eyes open, probably in more ways than one. And he said that we watched this lump disappear out of his arm and the pain shot up his elbow and vanished. And that was probably the beginning of what you were talking about. Since then, um, I've gone through a lot of trials with this stuff. My wife went through a six-year period of, of intense health issues and Spent over 50 days in hospital last year in one hit. Had to have open heart surgery. In the meantime, I'm doing meetings and praying for sick people and seeing God do miracles. And I was preaching in a little church. They wanted me to talk about the gift of healings. And I said, full disclosure, my wife's in hospital. Without a miracle, she's going to have open heart surgery. And that day, there was a lady that had no eardrum in her left ear for 41 years and God healed her and she could hear. This is up in Queensland and... I want, to, I want to tell you I'm, not in, I'm in sales, not management. I, but I know a guy. I'm a tradie, I'm a mechanic. I know a guy, he was a tradie, he was a carpenter. He's my friend. I could go on forever, but I'm out of time. But I'm so honoured to be able to just share that little bit with you. And I'm sure there's so many stories that have come out of this place. Bless you guys. Later we can have some time together and we can pray for people. We won't clap, Steve, but yes, we will out. Yes. <laughs> it's a story that d d deserves to be recognised. Thank you, brother, for sharing. There was a guy over 100 years before the, the stone of this chapel was put down who was having a similar but very different experience as a slave trader. But he was in an absolute mess in his life and God just overwhelmed him with his love and grace. And we have the beautiful hymn, Amazing Grace, because of that. Let's stand and sing. <laughs>
bring our prayers of adoration, confession, thanksgiving and supplication this morning. After each section, I invite you, if you wanted to, to join me in asking the Lord to hear our prayer. So I'll say, Lord, hear our prayer. And you can say, hallelujah, amen, or Lord, hear our prayer. As I mentioned, situations and groups of people allow, it's not just me praying for us together, we're coming to that wonderful throne of grace, boldly. So envisage someone in your mind's eye. Silently say their name, someone who needs a touch or a group of people from our God, our wonderful God. Let's pray. Father, you are beautiful beyond description. You are too marvellous for words too wonderful for comprehension, like nothing ever seen or heard, and who can grasp your infinite wisdom? Who can fathom the depth of your love? You are beautiful beyond description, majesty enthroned above, and we stand in awe of you, holy God, to whom all praise is due. We stand in awe of you. Lord, Hear our prayer. Lord, hear our prayer. God's word reminds us of our need to confess our sin and our wrongdoing to him and him alone. And it reminds us of the, the assurance that if we confess our sin, he's faithful and just and will forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. So let's pause in a moment of silence to bring our own prayers of confession to our Heavenly Father. Lord, hear our prayer. Lord, Father, we offer thanksgiving for all who have in the past and those who are continuing to enrich and serve our world and you, Father, through their use of their creative gifts, their industry, their innovation, their dedication to duty and service, their compassion and commitment to the needs of others. Especially today, Lord, we pray 
those from here in Ichunga, thank you that you've sent them out to use those gifts for you and for those in your world. We recognise, Father, it's only a village in just a small corner of your world. But we are so thankful that Ichunga and its people have been and are and will be known and loved by you. Lord, hear our prayer. And we come boldly to your throne of grace and mercy with our supplications. Lord Jesus, you are the one who healed all who were brought to you. We seek your healing touch today upon those who are sick in their body, their mind, their spirit, those who are known to us and those who are known only to you. Especially we uphold the children, Lord Jesus. We lift before you the lost, the homeless, those in need and any kind of adversity. Help them, dear Father of mercy and grace. We pray for all refugees, victims of war, especially those being persecuted for their faith. We pray for our leaders at every level of government and society. Especially today, we remember our King, Charles, and his representatives throughout the world. Would you grant them, Father, your wisdom and strength to administer and champion the cause of justice and care of the poor? Dear Jesus, we uphold all messengers of your gospel, that they and we would be empowered by your Holy Spirit to continue faithfully, boldly, courageously, to proclaim you and the power of your love wherever and whenever we can. On this day of celebration, Holy Spirit, we ask you would come. Pour out your gifts afresh. Give new gifts. Empower, anoint, and assist those who are here in this church and those to come in the next generations that we would declare and share your word and make disciples for our Lord Jesus and teach others, like Steve has, to know and to obey everything he's commanded. Lord, hear our prayer. And we join together in the prayer Jesus taught his disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Let's stand again to sing a beautiful song, King of Kings, which reminds us of the Jesus that Steve so beautifully shared with us a little while ago. Praise the Father. 
Thank you for bringing us the Bible reading this morning, bro. And then Matt will bring us the message for the morning. It is wonderful to be back here in this place, in a place that holds our family holds so dearly and amongst with people whom we love. So it's a privilege to read to you from the Scriptures. And uh, we're reading from Colossians 1. Colossians 1, verses 15 to 23. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. In him all things were created, things in heaven on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers, authorities or rulers or authorities, of all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things and in him. All things behold together. And he's the head of the body, the church. He's the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead. So that everything he might have, so that so that in everything he might have the primacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. And through him to reconcile himself to himself. All things, whether things on earth and things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Once you were alienated from God and you were enemies in your minds because of your evil behaviour, but now he has reconciled us by Christ, physical body, through death to the present. You, holy in his sight, without blemish and free from accusations. If, he, if you continue in your faith, establish and firm, and do not move from the hope that's held out in the gospel, this gospel that you have heard, that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven, for which I, Paul, have become a servant. Thank you, Laurie. 
Is it worth it? That's the question I was asked by someone from the community who's observed the activity around this building over the last six months or so. There's a lot, lot of work that's uh, taken place, particularly for those who've been here as locals, as uh, we've started outside with some paving, as uh, the roof disappeared and then reappeared again in a bright new shining uh, colour bond. Things have been painted and those who've walked through uh, can see some change inside. And obviously there's been some cost to that. Obviously there's been many hours of uh, blood, sweat and tears put into that as well. Uh, for anyone who knows the Achanga Church community, a lot of that work uh, was done voluntarily. And a lot of the building work over 140 years uh, it was not necessarily done by professionals. Is it worth it? I knew what they were asking. Behind the question was, uh, isn't the church a dying institution? All of this effort, all this money, isn't, wouldn't it be better to do what other places have done and uh, it become a nice cafe or a bit of real estate? Is it worth putting all of this effort after 140 years? Is there a future? Maybe I was wrong in their assumption behind their question, but I think that's where they were coming from. And I can understand that. Because uh, around, as you watch the news, perhaps uh, many of your friends and perhaps even yourselves, as we look at churches, it does seem like uh, there are aspects of the church that are a thing of the past. The things are dying, that the news stories about the church are often negative or sensationalized. Maybe there's other ways or different ways into the future. And in fact, some of you here today perhaps are here reluctantly. You've had a connection to this community. And I know that some over those years have not returned because of things that were said or things that were done. Or perhaps things that should have been said or shouldn't have been done. Some of you may be glimpsing us online today and couldn't bring yourself to be here because of those things. Over 140 years, there's guaranteed to be some who have been hurt. To you, I want to apologize on behalf of all those who have gone before over that time to say sorry. No excuses, but welcome, and we're glad you could join us today. The truth is, the church is not the building, although we mark a moment in time today. It is people, and people, we know, are a mixed bag. And amongst you, there are probably many relationships that have had all sorts of things that have gone on over the years. And today we celebrate a building and we celebrate a people. But behind it and through it, we celebrate something even greater. And that's been the thread of our service today. It's a God who is unchanging. And that there is someone like Steve that we know who isn't about hurtful words. Who is not even about condemnation. But who came to bring life and life in its fullness. And my answer to the question, is it worth it? All of this effort, all of this celebration is yes. For stories like Steve's, and no doubt many other stories, amongst you and your families and others who've come and gone over the years, who have not only experienced some sense of community, and the ups and downs of that, but have encountered that carpenter from Nazareth, and found that he has something far greater than just a great story in a history book. But he came to bring you life and life in its fullness. Some of your experiences, like Steve, have been clearly supernatural. Well, you can't deny that when someone is healed, there's no other explanation for it. Some of your experiences have been more gentle expressed or found in the love and the generosity expressed by this community as you've received gifts, as you've received a meal when you're sick. 
There are many ways that God is at work and continues to be. And behind it is the creator of the universe in the flesh who stepped down out of heaven as one of us, who lived and showed us what God was like, God the Father, and then gave his life so that all of us who feel we are not good enough could be made right again. Today's reading gives us just a snapshot of who he is, the image of the invisible God. We'll never fully get our head around that. How can God be wrapped up in a package like one of us? The firstborn over all creation. He was involved in the creation of all things. He's above all other thrones, powers, rulers and authority. The king of kings as we've sung. He's the head of a body and that body is the church. Every one of you. And we all have a different part to play in that. And he came, it says, well, God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things. I spoke to someone this week about whether they would come here today and they'd like to and they made the comment and I hear this often that maybe the roof would fall in if they've come into this space. I assured them that it's a new roof and that it'll be all okay. <laughs> but many like Steve don't feel that they can come through these doors for fear of what they've done and what God thinks of them. And the passage continues on and says, Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. But God reached out to us. We're not enemies with God. He loves us. He loves each of us and he came to give life and life in its fullness. So just briefly, let me share three things that Jesus is. The Bible describes Jesus in many ways with many images. The first one is this, the stone. We've heard the, the mention of the foundation stone today. And while foundation stones tend to nowadays be ceremonial and there's an inscription written in them, a foundation stone or a cornerstone in building, uh, in, not in modern day building, but it was used to uh, to line up the other stones. It was an important part of the building process, strategically placed to align two walls, and all the other stones were set in reference to that cornerstone or that foundation stone. The Bible describes Jesus as a cornerstone for our life. Get that part right, and the rest of life built around it falls into place. doesn't mean it won't be messy and cracks won't appear, but the cornerstone in place sets the foundation. Ephesians 2 says, Consequently, you're no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, with Christ himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple of the Lord. And in him, you too, are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. That's a beautiful picture of the church with Christ as the foundation stone, the cornerstone. Behind me, we have a beautiful floral display today. And thank you for Vanessa and Bethany for, for doing that. You may have noticed. We do this every week. Yeah. <laughs> This is, uh, looks beautiful, but for those who uh, know flowers, what might this look like in a week's time? Now, I know we've strategically picked some things that are long-lasting, but what might it look like in a month's time? What might it look like in a year's time? It will certainly not like, look like what it is today. So while admiring this beautiful work, what we actually have here today is a snapshot in time. For as soon as all of those were cut off from their roots and from the trees that grew them, these branches, as beautiful as they are in the moment, are no longer alive and living. And another image used in the, in the Bible, the next one, by Jesus is that he is the vine and we are the branches. And a vine, 
He uses the image of grapes and bearing fruit. Of course, to grow, to bear those fruit can't be propped up looking beautiful on its own. It must stay connected to the source. To stay alive and flourishing and fruitful, if that's what the vine is, our lives must be connected and rooted in him too. Built around him like a cornerstone, connected constantly so that our lives bear fruit and fullness and bring life to the world. I think many of us uh, forget about that and it's a daily exercise to plug back in to Jesus the vine. We like to, we look all right for a moment, maybe a week or so, and then suddenly bits start to fall off. We get down the vine. I am the vine, you are the branches, says Jesus. If you remain in me and I in you, you'll bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. The last one, the well. And there's so many more. In John, which uh, Steve would have read, John 4, Jesus encounters a woman who's drawing water at a well. And he says to her, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. I see so many people who are hungry and thirsty for meaning and purpose. Jesus says he is the living water. And he invites this woman and he invites us to come and receive, to receive life, to receive what we're thirsting for, to receive what will sustain us through the next day and through the challenges and the trials of life. The invitation is to come, come to the well. And Jesus put out that invitation then and he puts it out now. So today we do celebrate a building. We celebrate a people. But behind that, we celebrate a God who is far more than a good idea. A God who is living and active, who came to earth as one of us, who is there for Steve and who is there for many others like them, who's there for your children, your grandchildren, maybe even you in the place of turmoil that you're in now. And he says, come, build your life around me. Plug back in and find life and you'll bear fruit. Come receive the living water. May we not go from here and place ourselves back on the wall, but be connected. And today, if your building feels like it's crumbling, if you feel like your petals are drooping, or if you're feeling dry and thirsty, the invitation is for you. So let me pray for us. Pray for you. The invitation from Jesus is to come. Loving God, you are a gracious Father. And I thank you for each person that's here, for whatever it is that's drawn them to be here today. There is so much to be thankful for in the life of this community, past, present, and future. But we thank you that you're at the source of it, that the idea, the reason for setting these stones in place was to see life in its fullness brought to this village and beyond. We thank you for the ways that's happened. For each of us who are here today, feeling thirsty, feeling dry, feeling like it's all too much and it's crumbling down. We thank you for your invitation and the promise of what you are to us. We're each in a way like Steve and we don't fully understand. But God, thank you for your invitation. We reach out to trust, to receive whatever it is that you have to give for us today to sustain us for tomorrow and for the years ahead as we go back to wherever we go. Thank you that you walk with us. 
Amen. We're going to finish with a song and then some instructions before we conclude the service. Uh, but we would love to offer the opportunity at the end of the service. If you would love to pray with someone, you're very welcome to stay back and do that in here as well. We're finishing with a song that will be a familiar tune, but it seemed very fitting in the context of today. It's a song that could relate to a Chunga Uniting Church. It's a song that could be relating to you wherever you go back to today. God gives us a future, daring us to go. So I invite you to please stand as you sing with us. And may this be our prayer. Thank you all for being involved today. Uh, it is fantastic to see those here and those who are in our other spaces and to be able to celebrate uh, with you. Uh, thank you to our special guests, for particularly for making the time to be here with us. A few instructions uh, while you're standing. We do have a gift to give. Uh, on behalf of the church, thank you for joining us today. So from here, for those who are here in the building or in our spaces, uh, we'd like to invite you in a moment. I'm going to, to exit with the, the governor. We will then move out and we have morning tea that will be served out in the garden area with some barista coffee if you'd like to enjoy that. Uh, other tea and coffee will be served in the back rooms here. Toilets are in the room behind us. Wandine will also be open if you haven't had a chance to visit the historical display and see some of the history of the church as well. And there's some toilets in there. There's also a visitor's book, and if you'd like to uh, sign that, if you haven't already last night, uh, that will be out uh, in the garden. Steve's book, uh, Capturing Some of His Stories, which is, is really encouraging, will also be available in One Dean if you'd like to purchase a copy. Or a little later on, uh, as we move, uh, we'll ha have some sausages on for lunch. If you'd like to stay and uh, catch up with old friends and uh, share stories, uh, we encourage that. And at a certain point, the bell will ring and we're inviting you back into this space, if you like. And Steve's going to lead us in a time of healing uh, because we do believe in that power uh, that, uh, share, uh, that God has for each of us. And so that will uh, begin in here. You're very welcome to join us. 
I think I've covered everything. Fantastic. Well, let me close with uh, some words that may have been spoken 140 years ago at the opening service. It occurs in 1 Chronicles 29, and King David has just invited the people to respond and to give to the building of the temple, and they've given generously. And so let me pray this, his prayer, as a prayer for us on our behalf. Lord our God, all this abundance that we have provided for building you a temple, for your holy name, it comes from your hand, and all of it belongs to you. I know, my God, that you test the heart and are pleased with integrity. All these things I have given willingly and with honest intent. And now I have seen with joy how willingly your people who are here have given to you. Lord, the God of our fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, keep these desires and our thoughts in the hearts of your people forever. Keep our hearts loyal to you. May God, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit be with us today and every day. Amen.